rise this afternoon to make my contribution to this Honorable House on the bill currently before this Honorable House and being debated, and that is a bill to provide for the services uh, in St. Christopher and Nevis for the fiscal year commencing 1st January 2022 and ending on the 31st of December 2022. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I rise to make my presentation, I do so and I would want to stay, say from the onset that I lend my fullest support to this bill. Uh, being a member of this Honorable House on this side of the, the, the House, that is, I can do nothing other than saying that I am supportive because uh, contributions have been made by myself by my ministry and all other ministries within this administration. And so the content of this budget and this bill is certainly consistent with my belief. I also want to uh, give commendation to the mover of the bill and also the persons within the Ministry of Finance, Permanent Secretary, Assistant, uh, permanent Secretary, all of the other ministries and the management of those ministries that would have contributed to this uh, budget preparation and presentation. And I do so because, Mr. President, in these difficult and challenging times, it is always uh, a challenge, if I were to use that word again, to come up with what is, is workable and what will work for the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, given the challenges that we are facing. But these challenges that we are facing require some creativity on everyone's part. And I do believe that a lot of reasonable thinking would have gone into the compilation of this budget, and that is why they must be commended. Mr. Speaker, the budget for fiscal year 2022 has as its caption, investing in our people, putting St. Kitts and Nevis back on track. And that, of course, is, in my opinion, a very appropriate uh, caption to uh, be using at this time. And I will say to you, Mr. Speaker, that never before in the history of this federation, and this is a, a relatively young federation, Mr. Speaker, Never before in the history of this federation have we had to deal with the type of challenges that we have to deal with in 2020, 2021, and even going beyond this point in time. And that is why this particular caption uh, encompasses exactly what we are facing today. Invest in our, in our people, Mr. Uh, Speaker in my opinion, brings into focus the caring nature of this government. You understand it is about people and everything that you've heard thus far from this side of the aisle is about people. And you know, if I may just say at this point in time, Mr. Speaker, I have heard about people matter more and people matter most and that type of thing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't want to knock um, a Calypsonian who would have said that people once used to matter more. And that might be true. But this budget, Mr. President, has taken the entire thing a step further. And we are saying, and we have been saying for a number of years, that everything that we have done as a government, as an administration, is about people. So it therefore suggests to me that we have gone beyond the point of people mattering more, but people matter most to this government. People matter most to the government that I'm a part of on the island of Nevis. And we have been saying that for years. And when you look at this budget, which is people-centered, then it tells you that people has to matter most in what we do and what we say. As a matter of fact, this pandemic has certainly brought us to a point where that is rather apt at this point in time, where people definitely 
matter most. And that is, that is why I want to commend everyone once again who would have been uh, responsible for putting this budget together. It certainly addresses the needs of the most vulnerable among us. The most vulnerable persons among us have been captured in this budget. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, people matter most will continue to be borne out in our actions and in our speaking, well, in our uh, debates and dialogue. People will continue to matter most. Mr. Speaker, spend some time on people matter most because this pandemic has not been an easy one for all of us as a people. And when you listen to the presentation that was made by the mover of the bill yesterday and Minister of Finance, one has to say that the presentation that was made and the response that we would have heard thus far from the other side suggests to me that the other side is also in agreement with our thinking and our belief that people People has to be at the center of what we do and say. Mr. President, this government has certainly demonstrated that it cares. Why I say that? Not one soul have been sent home as a result of this difficult period that we're facing. Not one soul. And I believe the, uh, it was said yesterday that the head of the household, for example, is important to our thinking, our belief, and our decision-making process. Everyone in any household here in St. Kitts and Nevis are important to all of us, whether you're working or whether you're not. If you're working, of course, you're collecting your salaries. If you're not working, there have been a stimulus package that have been put together by this administration to capture those who are not working at this time. Not everyone, but as many persons as possible. But let us think about it, Mr. Speaker. Imagine, head of a household was sent home by this government at some point. Imagine, just imagine. It hasn't been done, but it's just imagine. That head of household, the only person working, you have, for example, one, two, three children. Just imagine sending at home that man or woman, whomever. Put them on the bread line. Just imagine that they have been sent home and been unable to provide for their family. Just imagine. And if it is that head of household has to pay all of the bills, have to pay the mortgage, have to send their children to school, and you send them home, it multiplies their difficulty or their difficulties. And that is why I come back to what I said as I started. That is why it is important to note our stance as a government. We believe in people, we put them front and center in our decision making process, and that is why no one was sent home. And that is why, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have to continue to ensure that our people are taken care of. But not only that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the case was made this morning didn't hear anything about pensioners. Well, not even pensioners were affected. As a matter, a matter of fact, pensioners, are, pensioners can go to sleep at night, comforted by the fact that this caring government has ensured that irrespective of the financial difficulties, they continue to collect their pension. And it's, it's by law. But not only that, the law is what it is. It applies to Antigua too. But I understand persons, they have been having challenges in collecting there in Antigua. But not the ancient kids' neighbors. And so long as this team unity government is at the helm of the administration of the affairs of this country, the assurance can be given 
that persons will be looked after and persons will not have to live with uncertain uncertainties as they go forward. Mr. President, this government has continued to undertake various infrastructural uh, development and projects, even though there have been difficulties. We continue to do so because of the management, the management of the finances and the affairs of this federation. And I'm proud to be a part of this particular uh, cabinet at this time, this administration, because all of us sit together as a cabinet and we look at the difficulties that are before us, but that has never ever dissuaded us in making the right decisions to ensure that all people continue to be looked after. Mr. President, I want to look at some of the things within my ministries. Before I get there though, I want to say to you, Mr. Pre Mr. Speaker, sorry. I keep saying Mr. President, but yeah. understandable. understandable, that's right. I, it's understandable. Yeah, but Mr. Speaker, I want to say to you that we continue to perform as a government. That is what we are elect elected to do. And that's what we continue to do. Mr. President, I want to say at this point in time that when I became the minister responsible for agriculture, fisheries, and marine resources, there were challenges. It was June of 2020. Challenges not only with the pandemic that we were facing, but challenges on a whole within the ministry and departments that were I trusted to myself and the team that I'm privileged to lead. And while I say team, I see members of my team here. I see the Permanent Secretary, uh, Mr. Ron Dublin, Collins would have come, and uh, my assistant there at the ministry. And I thank them for coming. The reason being, the support is needed, and the support is good. And I want to say at this juncture that I've had tremendous support from my team there at the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Fisheries, and Marine Resource. And teamwork, as they say, make the dream work. And we've had tremendous support among us in the ministry, and there have been collaboration, and we have been cohesive in our approach to revitalizing this sector. The sector would have had its, its challenges over the years, but we have never used those challenges as excuses. We've always faced our challenges head on. And Mr. Speaker, that is why I believe as I go through my presentation today, you would realize that we have had some tremendous successes over the last year. And of course, we'll lay out our programs going forward, plans and programs, that is, to ensure that we continue to, <laughs> for the lack of a better term, keep the momentum in agriculture. Keep the momentum because there is some momentum at this point in time. And why I say there is some momentum is because when you speak to farmers here on the island of St. Kitts, when you speak to farmers on the island of Nevis, throughout the Federation you hear persons are saying that they have a good feeling about agriculture, a feeling that perhaps existed before, but there was a point in time when there were some challenges and persons uh, would have drifted away from the sector, of course, but we have made it a pivotal part of our decision-making process to ensure that we are providing the support to our farmers and fisher folks. And that is why I said the momentum is coming back, we'll keep it, and we'll continue to build on it as, I go, as we go forward. Mr. Speaker, let me turn to agriculture. Because agriculture, we do believe, can be that fulcrum, that pivotal um, sector that can provide the type of development that we have always envisaged, envisaged here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Of course, over the years, there have been other sectors that have had 
more attention being placed uh, to those sectors. For example, upon the closer, closure of the sugar industry, persons would have gone into the hospitality and tourism sector. Many persons went into that area. Of course, it was thriving, and it has been thriving over the years. But what I can say is that over the last year, 18 months thereabout, there have been persons coming back into the sector. Why? I can say to you, Mr. Speaker, that every single one of us at some point during the day have to eat something. And we have always been preaching that we must eat local, buy local, eat what we grow, grow what we eat. So we have to plant. If we are thinking about import substitution and eating wholesome locally produced food, then we have to plant. And that is why agriculture has been getting the type of attention that it has received over the last 18 months and moving forward. Remember I just said we are regaining the momentum. We are keeping the momentum and we'll build on the momentum because we feel once we capture our farmers, once we capture those stakeholders who are in involved in this sector, we don't want to lose them. We do not want to lose them. So that is why this ministry continues to interact and engage our farmers and our stakeholders to make sure that that momentum that we are seeking to build on, we continue to do so. Mr. Speaker, Agriculture and Fisheries present us with a great opportunity for growth and development. The sector, for far too long, has faced a number of structural and other impediments to the realization of its full potential. Some of these impediments include low production and productivity, limited market access, on the developed value chains and dependence on rain-fed agriculture. The ministry has initiated serious efforts to comprehensively address these challenges. Mr. Speaker, let me from the onset establish the importance of the agricultural sector to our economy. Efforts that has been exerted in this sector over the past 18 months are geared towards regaining the prominence of farming, given the fact that we all must eat, as I just said, and the food must be of a sustainable quality and quantity. During this past observance of World Food Day, which was the 16th of October 2021, the theme for World Food Day was, and I quote, our actions are our future. Better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and of course that would lead to a better life. Mr. Speaker, I love this, this theme. It captures production, captures nutrition, it captures the environment which is so important to us, and all that I said before, will lead to a better life. So it is a simple but powerful theme. And so Mr. President, I don't want to sound like I'm preaching now, but I, since I'm speaking agriculture, I turn to the Bible to some extent and say, book. what can, good book, excellent book, yes. What passage of scripture I can use to capture the essence of what we are trying to accomplish in agriculture? I turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 62. And those among us who are Bible scholars will tell me even before I say it what Luke 9, 62 says. It says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And like I said, I didn't come to preach. But when you speak of plow, you're thinking of agriculture. 
and you put your hands to the plow, you are actually working, you are tilling the soil, and it is saying to us that you should not look back. So once we have gained the momentum, once we have that momentum in agriculture, this is not a time for us to look back. This is a time for us to look forward and to build on what we have started in agriculture in terms of transforming the sector, Mr. Pres Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in putting your hands to the plow, it means that there must be some level of commitment to what your purpose is. And so at this point in time, quitting is not an option. At this point in time, excuses are not an option. At this point in time, Mr. Pres Mr. Speaker, what is the option we are looking at is production and productivity in the sector so that the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis can realize its objectives of one, feeding its people, two, import substitution, and three, ensuring that our lives can be transformed in a way where we know we are eating locally produced food, food that is wholesome and beneficial to us. So Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, our aim in agriculture is to ensure that we are exerting the efforts that are needed to enhance and transform the agriculture and fisheries sector, even while doing so keeping in mind the challenges with climate change or growing population, the rise in food prices, disruption in, in supply chains and environmental stresses, which all have significant impacts on food security. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, I will say to you and this honorable house that adaptation strategies and policy responses, including addressing water challenges, land use patterns, food trade, trade sorry, post-harvest food processing, food prices and food safety are all being considered as we continue to press forward. I will go on, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, and say to you that the ongoing training and investment in the sector are strategically targeted towards the promotion of sustainable agricultural technologies and methodologies, building resistance to shocks or resilience to shocks, and ensuring increased production in crop, livestock, fisheries, and agro-processing. As I mentioned agro-processing, Mr. Speaker, let me look a bit closer at agro-processing because we do believe uh, that this is an excellent area that can be exploited to the benefit of agro-processors and the entire country as a whole. And so, Mr. Speaker, our agro-processing unit holds a bright future with great growth potential. Currently, the unit produces and sells 47 different products to leading supermarkets, duty-free shops at Port Zante, the RLB International Airport, major hotels, OT and St. Kitts and in Nevis, and other popular tourist sites. The income from the sales of these products provides support to the unit, which helps in its sustainability. Mr. Speaker, there are great opportunities for us as we forge ahead. And so, within the last year, we have sought to complete the work at the agro-processing unit at Needsmus. And we would have invested in excess of $375,000 to replace the roof, replace floor tiles, repainting of the building, so as to provide a much cleaner environment, thus ensuring food safety standards are maintained. Mr. Speaker, in value-added agriculture, we will certainly increase our focus on the production and manufacturing processes 
marketing and services that increases the value of our primary agricultural commodities. For example, we will use technologies to preserve and add value to specific local agricultural commodities such as guava, hot peppers, mangoes, etc., that can have a production surplus as they are processed into jams, jellies, concentrates, chips, pepper sauce, wines, etc. We will also continue the processing of raw traditional commodities such as cassava and banana into flour for the production of baked products such as bread and pastries. As I mentioned before, Mr. Speaker, we see great value in this particular area in that it can certainly provide employment opportunities. Additionally as well, it can provide great opportunities for the establishment of small businesses that can and will be achieved through a value added system as it generates higher return allow for the penetration of new markets, and potentially high value market that is, and extend the production season. Because with value added products, Mr. Speaker, I just mentioned, for example, hot pepper, to be processed into pepper sauces. I also talk about uh, guavas that can be processed into jams and jellies. Of course, that is extending that particular product into other forms that generates money at every particular step. So, Mr. Speaker, during the upcoming fiscal period of 2022, some of the objectives of the agro-processing unit will be to provide training and technical assistance to our agro-processors and the creation and expansion of small and medium-sized agro-processing enterprises. As I said before, I do believe that this area provides us with a golden opportunity to uh, provide additional employment and the establishment of businesses. So the agro-processing unit will also focus on product research and development for the transformation of local produce into value-added agricultural products as well as the transfer of technology for agri business development. Mr. Speaker, I will say at this juncture that we must plant and fish our way out of COVID-19 and its difficulties. And why I say plant, I have always stressed plant. And if you plant something today, plant some more tomorrow or plant the day after. I am just insisting and imploring our people to plant something, whatever it is. And I always say as well that you may not reap anything in a year or in two years' time. But here's the interesting thing. Many of the trees that we know reap a bountiful harvest from, we didn't plant them. I'm talking about mango trees, for example, jelly, or coconut trees. Many of these trees that we reap a bountiful harvest from, we did not plant them. Someone would have planted them for us or before us. And if we are thinking about sustainability, if we are thinking about food security going into the future, what we do now will impact the future of this country. And that is why I insist that we must plant and plant some more. And I did say we have to fish our way out of these challenges that we face with uh, COVID-19. But it must be done in a responsible and sustainable way. That is why uh, the Department of Marine Resource will continue to provide the assistance to our, our fisher folks to ensure that all that is done in the fishery sector is done in a sustainable way. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Speaker, sorry, in order to ascertain what we have done over the last 12 months, it is good to look at data because data help us to plan. Data give us a, a perspective or some perspective as to where we are, what we have accomplished, and where we should be heading to. So I'd like to look at some of the data that we would have collected over the last uh, 12 months at least, or to be more specific, 
up to October of this year, from January to October of this year. And these data, Mr. Speaker, will provide us with some insight as to what the stimulus package, for example, which we would have implemented last year, and we did so swiftly because we understood that persons in the farming and fishery sector are some of the most vulnerable among us. They are the ones who face some of the difficulties and challenges that we have with our weather systems or, or drought and, and um, well, of course, lack of rainfall and climate change, for example. So those are the most vulnerable. I will say this to you, Mr. Uh, speaker. A farmer can plant a crop, an acre of whatever it is, carrots, pepper, today, and expect to reap a bountiful harvest in three months. Something happens along the way. It is infested by pests or certain diseases, or predilacity, which is a major issue as well. And they lose the entire crop. So their efforts would have gone in vain. And that is why I say they are the most vulnerable among us. Matthew, when they, when they make money, they don't want to appear as if they make money. Eh? They don't say. But I know for sure there are times when I sympathize and empathize with our farmers because there are certainly times that they are exposed to some of the challenges and difficulties out there. But the numbers that I'm going to present to you, or the data that I'm going to present to this Honorable House, Mr. Speaker, speak volume to some extent. So here we go. Let me start with fishery, the fishery sector. Fish landings for the reef and dermosol species, and these include snappers, hind, butterfish, etc., doctorfish. For the period January to October 2021, amounted to 370,610 pounds, which are with an overall landed value of $4,2,280. And I'm speaking Eastern Caribbean dollars. This represents a 12% increase compared to the same period in 2020, where fish landing amounted to 329,740 pounds with a value of $3,737,710. Mr. Speaker, the increase we will submit was attributed to the provision of resources like fish trap, wire, made available through the COVID-19 stimulus package for the fishery sector to target reef and dermisole species. So there you go. You ask about the impact of the stimulus package, that is one example. And I'll go on further, Mr. Speaker. Fish caught in the coastal pelagic fishery. This include balahu, gar, jacks, etc. Amounted to 46,350 pounds with an overall landed value of 37 or $376,500 in January to October of 2021. Unfortunately, or to our disappointment, this represents a 19% decrease from the same period in the year 2020, where fish landing were 57,470 pounds, valued at $493,300. But however, Mr. Speaker, this, this decrease can be attributed to the reduction in the fishing effort by our fisher folks using net fishing gear. The coastal pelagic fishery is dominated by elderly fishers who are leaving the industry because of the inability of their bodies to take the rigors of the ocean environment or due to their mortality. Therefore, the younger generation of fishers require additional support from the ministry. And we intend to engage in training of these younger fisher folks to teach them how to mend these nets and basically how to uh, utilize that particular skill to ensure that we can see some uh, increase in these numbers come 2022. 
So that is an area that requires some attention and the ministry is prepared to do so. Mr. Speaker, fish caught by the ocean pelagic fishery. I'm speaking of tuna, marlin, swordfish, mai mai, etc. Amounted to 38,970 pounds with an overall landed value of $473,500 from January to October of 2021. This represents a 35% decrease from the same period of 2020 where fish landing in this particular area was 60,130 pounds valued at $729,460. Mr. Speaker, the decrease can be attributed and we can safely say it was as a result of the reduction in the number of fishing aggregate devices or FADs, which then resulted in the decreased fishing efforts from all official folks between January to August of this year, 2021. Additionally, we can also say that there was a decline in the demand for these type of fish because of the difficulties that COVID would have posed to the tourism industry. However, the Department of Marine Resource is supporting the deployment of, of FADs. We would have deployed a FAD or our first FAD in the North Atlantic on the 17th of September. And of course, this was done with the assistance of uh, folks in the fisheries sector. So at least there's some coordination and some collaboration uh, between both the Department of Marine Resource and the persons who would be impacted by these, the deployment of this particular FAD. We intend to deploy more FADs over the fourth quarter of this year, Mr. Speaker, because we are seeing an increase in the demand thus far for uh, coastal pelagic fish. As the tourism sector rebounds, as our hotels and restaurants see increased um, demands for this type of fish, we will see increased returns for fisher folks as well. So we'll see over the fourth quarter, some improvement in those numbers and those will be reported accordingly. So those are two areas that show some decrease, Mr. Speaker, but from here on, you will hear more about increases. For example, the total landing for conch fishery amounted to 72,990 pounds with an overall landed value of 729,000 $900 from January to October 2021. This represents a 16% increase from the same period in 2020, where conch landing was 62,920 pounds with a value of $629,200. The increase was attributed to an improvement in the fishing effort as a result of the relaxed restrictions that were in place up to a certain point in 2021. In 2022, 2020, sorry, my apologies, there were some restrictions that were in place, but once those were relaxed, then we would have seen uh, all divers or fisher folks go out and would have done uh, a tremendous job in ensuring that we would have had a 16% increase over a similar period or the same period last year. Mr. Speaker, in terms of lobster, we would have seen eight, 89,970 pounds of lobster which was reported and an overall landed value of $1,349,550. For January to October 2021. And Mr. Speaker, this is of note. This represents a 134% increase from this previous period of 2020, where lobster landing were 38,520 pounds, valued at 
$800, just over half a million dollars. But, of course, as I reported, between January to October of 2021, we would have seen an overall landed value of $1,349,550, and that is for just about 89,970 pounds of conks. This is phenomenal, Mr. phenomenal, Mr. Speaker. And we attribute, attribute this increase to the provision of resources, such as fish trap and wires, which were made available once again through the stimulus package that was offered through the fisheries sector. Mr. Speaker, in terms of overall fish landings, we saw 618,890 pounds of fish that was landed over the period on the review, that is January to October of 2021. This amounted to 6 million $931,730. Of course, this represents a 13% increase from the previous period in 2020, where fish landing was 548,780 pounds, valued at $6,167,470. Therefore, Mr. Mr. Speaker, what is obvious is that the more significant increases were seen in the reef and dermisole uh, fishery and also the lobster fishery. We are pleased with this, Mr. Speaker, because these numbers, in my opinion, and the opinion of my ministry can only get better as circumstances continue to, prove, to improve here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis and as the demand increase for fish and fish products. This, of course, we believe will lead to an improvement in our food security, sustainability, and the nutrition security that we uh, are seeking to accomplish. So, Mr. Speaker, that is the fisheries sector. I want to move to the livestock sector or the livestock production here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Now, during the period January to October 2021, the combined dollar value of crop and livestock production rose by about 17% when compared to the corresponding period in 2020. And Mr. Speaker, let me be clear, I'm spending time on these numbers because they are important to the discourse. Because once you would have invested in your people, once you would have invested in these sectors, you look for returns. You hear about return on investment? These are the returns that we are looking for. And that is why over the, this, the presentation of the uh, budget yesterday, you would have heard there are increased uh, monies that have been, uh, you know, increased monies that would have been placed into this particular ministry and sector so as to bring about the transitional, um, the transitional results that we are seeking to accomplish. So like I was saying, Mr. Speaker, 17%, uh, there was a rise in the percentage of uh, the dollar value of crop and livestock production under the period uh, that we are looking at, January to October 2021, when compared to January to October of 2020. And in terms of the dollar amount, though, we would have seen an increase of $9.2 million that was realized from crop and livestock production in 2021 as against $7.8 million in 2020. Now these numbers, in my opinion, are excellent numbers. These numbers can only get better. But let me go and do some Look at these numbers, sorry, in 
their specific areas in terms of crop, and then we look at livestock, for example. Let's look specifically at crop, Mr. Speaker. The total crop output for the period under review amounted to 2.2 million pounds versus 2 million pounds in 2020. This represents a rise in output of about 10%, which corresponds, corresponds to an 18% increase in estimated value from just over $6.5 million in 2020 to $7.7 .7 million in 2021. But Mr. Speaker, as is typical for the drier months, production in several of the crop areas have tapered off, while there, of course, would have been some appreciable gains during that period of time. But this is quite, this is quite exciting though, Mr. Speaker. For example, during the same period or this period on the review, we would have seen an increase of up to 643% in the production of cabbage, cantaloupe, carrot, squash, sweet potato, tomato, watermelon, and yam. Those areas would have seen a huge jump in the percentage uh, uh, of production and the corresponding value of the return on these particular production. A closer look, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at the month of October, for example, just to put things into context. In October, there was an increase of up to 150% in the production of cantaloupe, cucumber, peanut, pumpkin, squash, sweet pepper, sweet potato, tomato, and watermelon, as compared to the previous month of September. Pumpkin, of course, was the best performing crop for the month of October. Pumpkin would have realized 66,150 pounds was reported, a 150% increase compared to 26,460 pounds in September, pounds in September. Mr. Speaker, when we hear that nothing is happening in agriculture, when we hear that agriculture is not going anywhere, some people use those taglines, the number is in the details. The details is in, in the numbers. The numbers don't, don't, don't lie. The numbers speak volume to the effort that we have placed into agriculture here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. So Mr. Speaker, in this period of achieving agricultural transformation in the Federation, we are addressing transformation of our agri-food system and moving away from a high prevalence of subsistence and small-scale farming to high productivity as to bring about food security. Thus, our policy, our policy reform is essential to help agricult this agricultural transformation that we speak so glowingly about. We must no longer lag behind and use the opportunities afforded to us to advance our agenda for greater food security. Mr. Speaker, despite the ch great challenges we face, we have forged ahead with our plans to increase production in this all-important sector. Overall production performance is still positive despite multiple challenges experienced throughout the year. The additional resources made available through the Farmer Assistance Program and the ongoing support of the ministry continue to help farmers enhance their operations. Mr. Speaker, our farmer assistance program is designed to support farmers in their efforts to improve agricultural productivity, expand their production, and ensure a stable supply of produce. To date, Mr. Speaker, 220 farmers have applied and received assistance with the provision of one, building materials for construction of water harvesting sheds, farm storage sheds, bathrooms and farms, construction of pen, pens and, of course, fencing materials.
two, agriculture inputs such as seeds, chemicals, fertilizers, ground cover, plastic mulch, drip, irrigation system, etc. Three, oilers for tick control. Four, tagging machines and tags. Five, materials and wire for construction of structures for feral control. Mr. Speaker, as I speak of feral control, we're speaking of uh, feral predators such as monkeys and pigs. These continue to be a major problem in the uh, sector. And they have a devastating um, impact on crop production as well. I said before that a farmer can plant an acre of peppers, tomatoes, or whatever the case might be, and expect to reap a harvest in three months or up to six months. And then this, uh, this is one of the challenges that they would certainly face with feral predators and other issues may arise. But in terms of feral predators, we continue to exert much effort in this area whereby we continue to provide those persons who are in this particular area and assisting with the mitigation of the challenges that are faced here, we continue to provide uh, wire and other construction material that are needed to construct traps and so forth. Mr. Speaker, moving Moving on with the other uh, assistance that we have been providing, land preparation, of course, med medicine for livestock, wires, poles, ropes, and indeed, Mr. Speaker, these efforts have been well appreciated by our, our farmers. Moving along, Mr. Speaker, I want to touch on the FOIs the FOIS uh, extension of FOIS Outreach Center. Because that area was somewhat dormant for some period of time. And when I say somewhat dormant, there was some production taking place. But the ministry have sought to undertake every effort to rehabilitate the area, to bring it under uh, production once again, to ensure that we are meeting our targets, to ensure that we are moving one step closer towards food security and sustainability. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have engaged in a production program for roots and tubers in the Foyes area, and some 12 farmers have benefited from assistance at the Foyes Outreach Center. And as I speak further about the Foyes Outreach Center uh, in October, we would have empowered in excess of 20 farmers with land lease documents, Mr. Speaker. This has given them land tenure, and they, that has empowered them to the point where they can now go and plant, and plant with that level of assurance that no one will interfere with them in terms of their land or taking away the land because they do have that lease that they can uh, certainly use as one of those, uh, one of those assets or one of those um, things that can provide them with that level of comfort as they go about their production. This has never been done before, but we saw the need for this, Mr. Speaker, because we do believe that if we are stressing the importance of agriculture, stressing about the pivotal role that agriculture can play, we must support our stakeholders, and in this case, our farmers, who are willing to plant and want to plant, and they must be provided with the necessary tools that they can use to do their production. So that land lease and land tenure that they have now, that they now have in their possession is important to their future existence down there at the Foyes Outreach Center. And some good things will happen there, Mr. Speaker, because over the next year and beyond, we'll continue to have training there. We'll continue to have some of the implements and the seeds and seedlings that are needed by the farmers in the area. Remember, I just spoke about the root and tubers that we have invested in. And we're putting in place all of the necessary infrastructure to ensure that our farmers there at uh, the Foy's Outreach Center are comfortable 
and are given the necessary support for them to farm and to farm at a level that can be beneficial to all of us. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, seven farmers from the Sandy Point area, uh, from the Sandy Point farming community are involved in the Farmers Feed School Training Program, which is designed to expand the root and tuber production system there in Sandy Point. All the planting material have been provided under this program to the participating farmers. And the value of this assistance that have been given is just over half a million dollars. To be more specific, $540,000. That is the value of the assistance that was given to those farmers there in the Sandy Point area. And I want to say this as well, Mr. Speaker, these same uh, root and tubers, we are saying to farmers throughout the Federation uh, that cuttings will be made to uh, farmers who are interested in planting these uh, root crops. Cuttings will be made to them uh, in, the, in the ensuing months. Once we would have gotten to that level of production and maturity of that crop, uh, we certainly will do that. Because the more persons that get involved, the more production that will take place and the more we'll be able to feed ourselves, of course. Mr. Speaker, this is a significant point in time for this ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resource. It is a significant point in time because just a few months ago we would have launched what we feel is an important process that will see the transformation and growth of the sector here in the Federation. It is called the Agricultural Transformation and Growth Strategy 2022 to 2031. And we are working with the Food and Agriculture Organization to implement this particular strategy. But what we hope to accomplish with this transformation and growth strategy, Mr. Speaker, is one, to increase the income of small crop or small scale crop farmers and also small scale livestock farmers and fisher folks. And I say small scale, Mr. Speaker, because we start small and the thinking and the thrust should be to expand to the point where farmers become medium scale and even in some areas large scale farmers. Two, Increase agricultural output and value addition. Three, improve the infrastructure and the various farms so as to bring about sustainability in water storage and supply, as well as to provide access to irrigation systems. Four, boost host household food resi resilience. Five, strengthen research and innovation by using data to drive decision making and performance management. Six, implementation of policies to mitigate against food system risk, such as food sustainable, sustainability, climate change, pest and disease, and global uh, price shock as well. So, Mr. Speaker, this policy we believe, or this growth strategy we believe, will seek to transform the sector and it is my hope as the Minister of Agriculture that we will receive the support of all of the stakeholders, whether in the private sector, public sector, or farmers, fisher folks, vendors, agro-processors, academia, and all stakeholders who have an interest in seeing this sector realize its true potential. So we would all have to step up to the plate if we are to address the challenges that we face in this sector to bring about real and meaningful reform. In saying that, Mr. Speaker, I also want to, at this point, uh, solicit the support and, as well, thank the various regional and international agencies that have given us support over the years. I'm speaking of the Republic of China Taiwan Technical Mission, right here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. International and regional agencies such as AICA, such as AICA, FAO, CARDI, 
We are certainly seeking their support as we implement this growth uh, and transformational strategy that we are seeking to implement because we do believe that their effort in the past and in the future will see us uh, realize the potential that we are seeking to accomplish. Mr. Speaker, there's no doubt that the sector or this sector is highly vulnerable to climate change <clears throat> and increased incidents of natural disasters and other extreme weather events. But I am absolutely certain that once we are to implement this strategy that I'm speaking of, we will see the strengthening of the agricultural sector and the resilience to climate change and natural disasters all these factors, I believe, can be addressed in this strategy. And that is why I reiterate once again that the support is needed by all of the various stakeholders uh, in order for this strategy to be implemented and bear fruit. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, ultimately, our investment in this sector, I'm absolutely certain, We'll see the realization of employment creation, economic growth, poverty reduction, and overall national development. Mr. Speaker, if I may move on to our veterinary services. So I'm going to look at our livestock sector to some extent and report accordingly as we would have seen some developments in this sector over the last uh, the last year or the period on the review, which I am certain will be important to our stakeholders or farmers, livestock farmers that is. Mr. Speaker, the veterinary division will continue to provide technical support to the livestock sector with a view to maintaining a healthy livestock population and to prevent the transmission of animal borne diseases to humans through early detection. This division will continue to serve and increase its operations and efficiency as an early warning mechanism that will facilitate prevention and or establishment of transboundary animal diseases. Mr. Speaker, the veterinary division, um, division's mandate is to ensure the development of an efficient alert system that facilitates the early detection of animal diseases of, which are of economic importance or interest for public health, as well as swift intervention to limit their establishment. Thus, creating an environment in which livestock can thrive in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. The capacity of the veterinary laboratory diagnostic and food quality control will be increased. And so, Mr. Speaker, the work program for the livestock unit for 2020, let's look at that. The livestock unit for 2020, their work program will include, one, the training of livestock farmers in production and financial management. Two, the introduction of methods for the control of order in the poultry pens. Three, development of breeding programs for cattle and swine on farms and also at the Bayford Center for Excellence. Four, bringing farmers together to supply mutton and beef consistently to supermarkets as a collective body. Five, seeking out alternative feed sources for poultry and swine and experimenting on a rational uh, grazing and trail rationalized grazing, sorry, and uh, trellised grown legumes. Six, a program to manage access road to farms will be reintroduced along with projects on paddock rehabilitation. And Mr. Speaker, these areas that I just mentioned, these six areas, along with other areas, will receive the full attention of the uh, ministry over the ensuing year so as to ensure that our livestock sector, an area that we are committed to ensuring that there is transformation in that sector, continue to see 
the results that are envisaged over the ensuing year. I want to touch quickly, Mr. Speaker, on the Bayford Livestock Center of Excellence, because I do believe that the Bayford Life Livestock Center of Excellence is a dramatic and significant transformation of some 183 acres of land into a livestock center of excellence which will directly benefit farmers and the country as a whole. The program that will be undertaken there will see the establishment of breeding programs to maintain and support sustainable improvement in livestock production. It is an area that was dormant for many years, Mr. Speaker, and we uh, have taken on the challenge to revolutionize that area. And I believe if one were to go there now, they would see that type of transformation that has taken place within a short uh, year thereabout. Uh, it was dormant since about, I believe, about 1993. So if persons who are old enough who would have worked there in the past or who would have visited that area in the past were to go there now, they will be amazed to see the transformation that has taken place. We'll continue to work on that area because we believe that the improvement of our breeding stock here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis is important for us to ensure that we are providing healthy meat supply to our population. And the types of breed that we are working on there, Mr. Speaker, will certainly provide uh, much more in terms of the density of the meat and the quality of the meat that will be produced uh, by our farmers to the various, um, to the various hotels, restaurants, and consumers here in the Federation. Mr. Speaker, there's an area that the ministry is certainly about to address in the ensuing year, and that is the area of poultry or egg production. Over the years, Mr. Speaker, we have seen the establishment of the poultry sector whereby the egg productions here on, 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 uh, in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis have gotten to a point where there is some sustainability and there is constant supply of eggs throughout the year, except, of course, during the Christmas and festive season. So the demands have been met over the years, and our poultry farmers must be commended, uh, specifically our egg producers. Uh, but we have seen, in some regards, that they have been challenges to our egg producers, whereby persons who are not bona fide poultry farmers have received a license to import eggs into the Federation. We believe it is time for us to adopt a policy whereby only bona fide poultry farmers are allowed to import eggs into the Federation. Now, on the island of Nevis, we have sought to address that issue and it is a, an issue that we look at here on the island of St. Kitts, so that the entire federation can have uh, some common, co commonality in this area. I believe it's an area that requires the support of government so that we can uh, continue to see the sustainability of that particular area. Egg production is important to the Federation, of course. And if we are to lend support to areas that we believe can provide that long-term sustainability, I think we should do so. So I do not believe that I'll be speaking out of turn if I were to say that we will address this issue during the course of this upcoming year. It is important to do. And coming out of COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, as we continue to see some improvements, we must be able to look back at this particular point in time. And so we have used this opportunity to put in place certain infrastructure and certain policies to address the concerns that have been there over the years. I've said in the past that COVID-19 have certainly provided us with some unexpected opportunities and realities, of course, glaring realities. 
So the opportunity that we have now is to address some of these issues that have been plaguing us over the years. And that is why I do believe that it is important to address this issue if we are to build this particular uh, area in agriculture, poultry, that is, uh, because it is one that I do believe that we can see some sustainability, Mr. Speaker. So that is an area that we look at further as we go along. Mr. Speaker, let's turn to crop production. Crop production, the crop production unit will focus on agricultural be best practices to improve growth, development, and yields of crops over the ensuing year. The strategy will include a combination of crop scheduling, seminars, and crop forecasting. The current production system for crop farm farming, more specifically vegetable production, is over 80% rain-fed. And so, Mr. Speaker, limited rainfall poses a serious threat to food security within the local farming community because, as stated, a significant number of farms are rain-fed uh, dependent. Therefore, we will introduce measures to mitigate the problems of limited rainfall and how we choose, well, we are, how we propose to do that, I should say, Mr. Speaker, is that we will uh, implement initi initiatives aimed at bolstering water security, which will include unfarm water harvesting and storage, reactivating water dams, uh, which currently lay dormant. And uh, some of these dams, of course, have been dormant and have not been maintained for some time. So we'll pay special attention to that in the ensuing year. We'll construct new dams, of course, and we'll encourage the use of irrigation systems and farms to ensure water uh, efficiency and the um, use of water in the most uh, resilient way and, and the most practical way that is, so as to eliminate water wastage. Mr. Speaker, moving along, research on different varieties of crops will be done that are drought and or flood resistant. Technology transition is an area that we would be focused on heavily during this upcoming year. As a matter of fact, we would have done some uh, work in this area before in terms of the importation of 10 greenhouses through, during the year 2021. Next year, we will empower additional farmers by importing additional greenhouses. We do believe that greenhouse technology will play a significant and pivotal role in the overall development of the sector. For example, Mr. Speaker, a greenhouse that is 100 by 40, 100 feet by 40 feet, can provide the type of production that you will get in open field farming of about an acre. And indeed, open field agriculture lends itself to certain conditions that are not as impactful on greenhouse farming or that particular environment. I am very strong on, on this, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, it is an area that I have some passion about because I do believe that based on the results we have seen from those who are engaged in greenhouse farming or that particular technology, I do believe if we were to have in excess of 30 farmers, for example, on Sinkids, on a 30 farmers, engage in Nevis with one or two greenhouses or even more, we can see the production of products such as lettuce, tomatoes, cucumber, even herbs and thyme. And then we talk about import substitution. That will be an excellent way to achieve such. I want to say at this point in time, Mr. Speaker, there was a point in time just about, about three months ago where there were some issues with shortage of tomatoes. Why? There were significant dry conditions in California, for example, 
which is the largest producing state or the largest uh, producer of tomatoes in the United States. So with those difficulties, you had a fall off in production. We were not able to utilize that information and ramp up our production here in the Federation so as to make up for that shortfall. Persons who are engaged in greenhouse production, we will give them the necessary training to follow these trends and, 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 and data that is uh, available to them throughout the world to assist them in their production. So for example, as I'm saying, if you hear about these challenges in California, you would understand that I have a greenhouse or some greenhouses. Well, this is time for me to plant or produce tomatoes, for example. And the good thing is that in this condition, you're producing for 12 months of the year, nonstop. So it therefore means that you're able to satisfy your market demands, you're able to make money, which is the ultimate goal. And so, Mr. Speaker, over the next 12 months, we'll invest further in greenhouse technology, but we'll initially provide the, the, the training that is needed to our potential greenhouse farmers. So, Mr. Speaker, those are, that is something to look forward to over the next couple of months. Technology and innovation in farming and the information and knowledge that is garnered must be the driving force behind agriculture if it is to uh, realize the potential that we are speaking of. Mr. Speaker, moving right along, uh, let us look quickly at the, our crop division. Uh, the work plan for our crop division at the Outre Division Outreach Program include a variety of strategies to ensure that the full range of training services reach our farmers in all districts. I spoke about the Foy's Outreach Center before, but I want to say again that at the Foy's Outreach Center, uh, we will certainly provide additional technical assistance to our farmers training and this will be uh, the, the main center whereby these uh, training and engagement in, 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 in strategies that are going to be used to improve the sector will be done. Uh, we will work with our farmers to fully supply local demand for sure once we are able to empower them to the point where they are producing. Mr. Speaker, how much time I have? I'm, I'm almost done. 12 minutes. 12 minutes more? Oh. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, moving along quickly, um, just to report further on the policy and planning unit. This was a unit that uh, we felt from the onset could play a major role uh, in the work at the ministry. And so, the policy and planning unit work program includes establishing, operationalizing, and maintaining a system uh, that is geared towards the collection of data, analyzing that data, storage of that data, and disseminating it to our, our stakeholders. The unit will be responsible for the agricultural census that will be undertaken in the, in the new year. Uh, 2022, and a policy and planning unit will work with our farmers, fisher folks, agro-processors, allied institutions, and other relevant ministries and stakeholders to harmonize agricultural, uh, the agricultural sector policies, plans, and strategies within the Federation. These, these actions will be in alignment with the, uh, with the growth strategy that we uh, intend to implement in February of 2022. And indeed, the policy and planning unit, unit certainly is a unit that has certainly uh, provided this ministry, the agriculture ministry, with all of the support that is needed to ensure that the ministry's 
work program as well is implemented in a way that is satisfactory to all. So I want to commend all those who are working in this particular unit because we have felt the impact in a short period of time. And what you see coming from the Ministry uh, of Agriculture has certainly been as a result of their efforts. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, as the economy rebounds, I'm going to move on quickly to the Department of Marine Resource quickly. As the economy rebounds from the negative effects of the pandemic, the development of the blue economy is significant to support our sustainable uh, income generating, generating services for the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. In 2022, we propose to further strengthen and develop enabling legal and policy frameworks to ensure the sustainable use of the ocean's resources safely and efficiently. The Department of Marine Resource will continue the training activities for our fishers. Basic, basic fisher training courses are again planned for 2022. These courses will teach fishers how to fish sustainably to improve production while addressing their safety and general business concerns. We have re repositioned ourselves, Mr. Speaker, for the enhancement and improvement that is ahead. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Marine Resource program is aligned with the government's commitment to ensure a brighter future post-COVID and to put our economy back on track. Mr. Speaker, as I go into a wrap-up phase, I want to just quickly touch on just a few things quickly, because at least there are some capital projects plans for, planned for next year that I'll just highlight quickly. Of course, we'll continue with the construction of the veterinary uh, lab. Rehabilitation of the old road fisheries complex will come to a close, we're hoping, in 2022. Uh, of course, agricultural supports project will continue. The Bayford Livestock Center of Excellence will continue to see some work and improvement. Hopefully in 2022, we'll see the completion of those works. And indeed, the pest control program will continue in 2022. Uh, and even as I say that, Mr. Speaker, and even in these challenging times, uh, we have seen the ministry continue to fulfill its obligations and payment to the various um, international and regional institutions such as FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Caribbean uh, Agriculture Research and Development Institute, CARDI, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture, ICA, and also the Caribbean Agriculture Health and Food Safety Agency. Uh, of course, the Caribbean Regional fisheries mechanism, all these areas, uh, all these institutions continue to uh, receive the support of the Ministry of Agriculture here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis as we get their support as well. It is a process whereby we pay and they reciprocate their effort by providing us with the necessary training and other support that are needed. Mr. Speaker, quickly as well, uh, We'll see work continue on the improvement and expansion of the uh, Basti Abattoir uh, facility. And indeed, throughout this year, we would have seen a significant work done on the Basti public market. It is indeed a wonderful sight to behold now, Mr. Speaker. I've heard of some glowing reports about the facility there. I have gone there and I am pleased with the aesthetics and the overall transformation of the Bastia public market and the services that are being provided there. And I want to commend all who would have been responsible in bringing that particular facility up to the standard that we can all be proud of. And while I'm at that, I will want to say as well, and in uh, invite the entire uh, Nevision and, and Kittishan public to the Bastia public market next Wednesday, the 22nd of March. Where am I going back to March? No, there's something about the 22nd of March, I remember now. <laughs> but the 22nd of December for a night market. It is something that we started last year, December, under COVID conditions, Mr. Speaker. And the, the 
The support we received then was tremendous. Even during uh, um, the restrictions that we were encountering at that time. And we've had a, quite a number of them, uh, maybe about, I say quite a number, but about three or four of them throughout the year. But this coming Wednesday, next week that is, the 22nd of December, we will see the first anniversary of the hosting of that particular event. And I expect the turnout this time to be twice as large as last year. Well, the restrictions have been eased, but we still encourage persons to adhere to the necessary protocols. But that particular event, I'm inviting persons to come to the Bastia Public Market next Tuesday, next Wednesday, the 22nd of December, for that night market. It is one that is catching on. And why it is important, Mr. Speaker, is because our stakeholders, our farmers, our fisher folks can come and sell their produce and make some, some additional cash, some additional monies. Because ultimately, you plant your, 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 your produce or your products, you plant them to ultimately sell them. And that is an avenue through which we have provided for our fisher folks and our farmers to come and sell some of their products. So I'm inviting one and all to come to that. So Mr. Speaker, I believe my time is almost up. So let me go into a wrap-up phase and say to you, that agriculture in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, I can safely say it's on a road to recovery. It's on a road where we feel that the momentum that we have at this point in time can only be increased and will ramp up the production of food in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. We will continue to solicit the support of all of our stakeholders because they are the ones we continue to uh, depend on. So I want to say that this budget, Mr. Speaker, is one that will lay down the foundation for the construction of and the transformation of our country through agriculture. But before we reconstruct, we must ensure that the foundation is strong. And this is the reason why the government is putting so much effort into ensuring that our budget return of the returns from what is budgeted is there to show at the end of the budget cycle come 2020. I believe that the transformation is on its way. I can feel it and I am a part of it so I would know that we are feeling that transformation in the sector. So I want to at this point in time extend my sincere appreciation to the members of staff so the permanent secretary, as I said before, Mr. Ron Dublin Collins is here. Uh, the persons at the planning and policy unit, persons at the Department of Agriculture, veterinary services, all of the uh, supervisors and workers, or PEP, or not PEP, but our step workers, or persons who are part of the peace program who continue to pro partner with our ministry. I also want to um, acknowledge uh, the director of the Department of Marine Resources, Mr. Or Dr. Mark Wilkin, and his staff for their effort in the fisheries sector. I also want to commend them for... Williams. Mark Williams. Well, Williams. Mark Williams, yes. And I don't got a couple of cases here. Yeah, Dr. Mark Williams, sorry. Uh, and, and his staff there at the Department of Marine Resources. And also commend him and the entire staff for their vision and effort to transform that sector as well. So, Mr. Speaker, as I wrap up, I want to give my heartfelt thanks as well to all of our general auxiliary workers. Sometimes they go unnoticed, but we want to say that uh, we embrace them because they're just as important as, you know, established workers, all of them put out human service on a daily basis to make sure that their efforts are being felt. So even those down at the uh, FOIS Outreach Center, I want to commend them for their effort. When you go there, FOIS is a transformation of what it once was. You go up to Bayford, like I say, I want to commend the staff there as well, uh, Mr. Bigel Fleming for his effort there as well, and all those who continue to press on in this particular ministry to ensure that our efforts are felt and 
the entire Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis continue to be proud of us. I want to say, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that I lend my overwhelming support to this budget. I believe it is one that is visionary, transformational, and one that will see uh, the uh, tremendous efforts on the part of this government be a fruit in 2022. And also, I want to say that I myself have been proud to be uh, the one that has been charged with the transformation of agriculture.